step into the shadows and unlock the chilling secrets within the walls of the most haunted house. Our podcast will send shivers down your spine as we delve into spine-tingling tales of restless spirits and unexplained phenomena. Are you brave enough to face the Anderson Hotel? scoured the podcast world and finally found us newsworthy with steve and jerry where we delve into all things mysterious macabre or out of this world and decide if they are truly newsworthy two words and two question marks why should you work with ed lock A better question is, why wouldn't you work with him? He is a proud to support an amazing lender, USA Mortgage. When you work with them, you can expect a home financing experience that is free of hassles and headaches. They have complete control over your loan due to in-house operations such as processing, underwriting, closing, and funding. USA Mortgage represents a lot of fantastic things but they are especially thrilled to partner in several community outreach programs, including Habitat for Humanity, Home Sweet Home, Veterans Community Project, and many, many more. They love going to work every day, which means they love working for you. Ed wants to be your lender for life, so reach out to him today and get the journey started. If you would like more information, please reach out to Edlock at area code 502 650 NMLS 448908, USA Mortgage NMLS 227262. USA Mortgage is an equal housing lender. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions may apply. For licensing information, go to www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Good evening, Mr. Jerry. How are you? Hello, Steve. I am great and getting better. Sweet. That's awesome. Absolutely. That is awesome. I'm glad to hear it. I uh, had the privilege, we have the privilege today of doing an awesome interview. I'm, I'm stoked for that. Absolutely. We've been looking <laughs> forward to this for a long time. Been trying to make it happen for a minute, haven't we? Yes, we have. <laughs> That's what happens when you have three individuals that have three different, very, very busy lives. Yep. Uh, so that's all good. But the stars finally aligned. We did. And it happened. Finally. So stoked for that and uh, can't wait. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. So, uh, Jerry, tell me about your week. How you been? Uh, Very well. It has been a very good week. I love this time of the year. I was born and raised an old farm boy. When you're a farm boy, fall is uh, a time that things are finally settling down. There's a little bit of a, a reprieve. Uh, you know, spring, it's crazy and hectic. Summertime is so miserably hot and you're starting the the harvest season and all that. And early fall is an extremely busy time. Fall is a wonderful time. It's always been my favorite time of the year. Oh, wow. I like it just because it's beautiful. Yeah, I, it is. The one thing, it, it especially here in central Kentucky, we have a huge, the, the color palette of our trees is is just phenomenal. All yep. of the Appalachians are that way. North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, northern Georgia, that whole area, just gorgeous. Anywhere along that trail, um, uh, just beautiful this time of year. But uh, the the saddest part, this is also a sad season for me. Because it's starting to get cold, and I have less time to ride my bikes. <laughs> I have to start picking and choosing when I can ride, and when I no, I can't ride today. It's too cold. But if it's not raining, snowing, uh, you can always just put a thicker jacket on, can't you? Yeah, I mean, you can, I have a lot of warm or warm gear for cooler riding, but once it breaks through and it starts getting to you, it there's no. <laughs> 
It's kind of like rain. It's like the water. Like you can wear a rain jacket when you're riding. Eventually, the water will find a way in, and when that happens, you become miserable. Well, anyway. I can see the water. I just yeah. and again, I'm not a bike rider, yeah. so I just cold air is yeah. the same way. I got you. <laughs> Back to the the leaves. If you, it's not only Kentucky. You're right. You mentioned about the area, but it, if you ever have a chance to drive the Skyline Drive, any part of that, from where does it go? North Carolina, I don't think it goes to South Carolina, does it? No, uh, it's North Carolina. It's it's. I've actually ridden it on my bike, not during fall. It, it's beautiful. Big Parker, have you ridden all of it? The Blue Sky Parkway. Yeah. Yeah. The what now? The Blue Ga- the Blue Sky Parkway is what it's called. I thought it was called the Skyline Drive. No. It might be, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm right. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I've ridden on part of that as well. <laughs> Let me look it up. Maybe, but I... I'm... Driving Skyline Drive, Shenandoah National Park. There you go, well... How much does it cost for Skyline Drive? Do you have to pay for Skyline Drive? Oh, okay. Well, you, you got Skyline it. Skyline Drive is a route in Virginia. It's a 105-mile national parkway that runs the entire length of the National Park Service, Shenandoah National Valley, in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, generally along the ridge of the mountains. And it goes down into North Carolina slightly, I think. Uh, yeah, beautiful. It's not just Kentucky, but if you ever have a chance, whether it's Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina... For a real scenic route, beautiful, absolute gorgeous drive. So tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about the Haunted Anderson Hotel. So I thought it'd be kind of cool if we kind of find a couple of good ghost stories that we can add to it before we get to the interview. You have a good one, Jerry? Before we do that, I got to tell you about what I did yesterday. What did you do yesterday? I went to the zoo. Okay. Yeah, and they only had one dog there. One dog? Kind of. Crappy zoo is this? Oh, it was a shit zoo. (laughs) You don't say. I think it's a very apt description for that zoo, I must say. We're a little late. I thought we was going to get started about 6.30. It's only 7.40. Yeah. 6.30 is my favorite time of the day, by the way. It is. Hands down. Hands down. Favorite time of the day. Yes, it is. (sighs) That was... Terrible. That was good. I, I can't believe. I've said this to you on multiple occasions. This you time takes I, never a dead joke. I can't believe you've had a week and that's what you come up with. Yeah, <laughs> I can. Uh, I can see that. So anyway, anyway, get to your tell ghost us, story. Tell us your ghost story. Jerry. I was born and raised down in Monticello on the Kentucky Tennessee border, not far away from us. Is Cumberland Falls. You ever been there? I love Cumberland Falls. Gorgeous area. Yeah. I don't know if you ever heard, but there is the, the legend of the Ghost Bride of Cumberland Falls. By the way, Cumberland Falls State Park is in Whitley County, Corbin, Kentucky. It's known as the Niagara of the South. And in the 1950s, a bride and groom came to Cumberland Falls for their honeymoon. They wanted to take a photo with the falls in the background. They found an overlook just a few hundred feet from the falls. It would provide for a gorgeous photo, or so they thought. And it's believed that while the bride was on the edge of the cliffs, that she simply lost her balance and she fell to her death. She was almost immediately followed by her devastated husband who plunged in after her and also died. That area is still called Lover's Leap to this day. She consistently appears to many people above the cliffs, around the falls and around the State Resort Park DuPont Lodge. And she's also been seen and heard weeping by a number of park employees and, and customers. And the Cumberland Falls is also home. Okay, that just went away. Now yeah, it's back. <laughs> My computer screen went blank for a second. Cumberland Falls is also home to some accounts of phantom creatures along many paths to the falls. But the Ghost Bride is far and away the most popular. I was born and raised in that area. I'd heard that several times before, but yeah, the ghost bride going back 75 years almost now. Wow. Now, Fell to her death. Cumberland Falls, for anyone who wants to tour this area, is famous twice a year for the having moonbow. a world-famous moonbow. It's one of the only places in the yep. world you can see a rainbow from the full moon. It's, it's phenomenal. I've actually got to see it one time, and... Uh, it was gorgeous. Actually, my first marriage was at the DuPont Lodge in Cumberland Falls. Did not know that. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, uh, 
uh, to where I married my first wife, Melissa, who is a wonderful person. <laughs> totally agree. Wonderful person. She had, uh, and, and uh, just can't say enough good things about her. We were young and I was dumb, and that's where we'll leave that. <laughs> But um, that's where our first, our, my, our wedding was, was at the DuPont Lodge in Cumberland Falls. Is that when you got to see the moon bow? Uh, no, it was at a totally different time. Uh, but I lived in Corbin for a while. Yep, so uh, we got to, we made sure to that. make it out there and and uh, see it. Um, so I have a lot of ghost stories. And I, it was really hard for me to pick, pick one. one or two. Uh, you know, during the upcoming interview with Jeff, I have one, so I don't want to take that one. Um, and we had, we've had several ghost stories submitted to us, um, but I don't want to really take theirs. And uh, you've told one, not ghost, I don't know what you would call it, that the church, the yeah, youth center? Yeah, I, I bring that up to Jeff and tell him. Okay, that. okay. I, we're going to take him up on a ride and let go. him know where it's at. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, the one that I would like to share tonight is simply one of my best friends growing up. Her grandfather and grandmother lived in this little house in, in my hometown of Cynthiana, and they lived there for a long time. And when he passed away, she started getting visits. And From him? That's kind of what we think, honestly. I mean, they'd been married for 100 years. You know, it's one of those... Oh, they met each other at 15, and he died at 80, and they were still together yeah. type deals. Um, but weird things would happen in their house, like the radio would come on by itself. It had never done that before. You could change the station, and it would go back to the station that he liked, <laughs> if you will. You would see shadows go across the wall where you never saw shadows before. Um, now, How many of these does it take before you decide, I need to move? Uh, well, in, in all honesty, she felt it was comforting, very comforting yeah. to he feel. He was coming back to, yeah. Right. I can see that too. Yeah. So, uh, when she finally was forced to move, the house is still there. Uh, you can, I'm sure it's rented at this point, but, uh, I'm so it survived the flood. We had a big flood back in 96, 97, 95, somewhere in that ballpark. And it was somewhat underwater so but it did survive there are people living it now but i don't know if the hauntings continue but i'm a firm believer that there's definitely something out there whether that is a ghost or a demon demonic force trying to make you believe or trying to pull you in a different direction or just hard to believe that there are so many stories out there that you can write them all off as, nah, that person's nuts, or nah, I didn't see anything. That was just this, or that was just that. But um, that was the one I like to share because it's a good ghost story, if you will. And it's personal. Yeah. That means personal. far more than something that I've you know, read about on a few websites. Yeah. I'd heard about it for many years, but didn't remember the details and, so, yeah, for the research, I had to go look it up on the website. This one, all you did possibly was... Experience it. Uh, okay. I thought maybe possibly you called your dad or someone in that area and yeah. asked them a couple of questions. But totally different. Even if you'd done that, even if it wasn't just relying on memory, even if it's going to family members, big difference in researching something sure, on the internet. Sure, sure. I mean, and I think that people... Like, I have a great aunt or an aunt that is just perceptive to stuff like that um i will never forget and, and this is probably goes beyond ghost but i'll never forget i was in west alexandria ohio working as a store manager and i just got off the phone with my higher up and they said they were going to make me a part of history for the company and I was like, oh, yeah. And they're like, yeah, we're going to make you the person with the longest move, company-sponsored move in the company. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so anyway, they were, they were going to make me the longest company-sponsored move ever. They were moving me from New West Alexandria, Ohio, to Salmon, Idaho. And that's a long move. That is a long move. Um, but... 
I had just got off the phone with him. I accepted. I was like, that sounds freaking amazing. Why not? Right? Because I was young and that was cool. In Idaho. Yeah. Never been there. Never been there. Probably knew very little about it. Or at least I wouldn't have. Nothing. And uh, so I get off the phone. I hadn't even told my wife at the time. And my Aunt Becky calls me and she goes, "Um, when were you going to tell the rest of us? I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I know all about you move out west. I'm yeah. like, that's so. <laughs> I mean, I've heard you like tell that story 15 minutes. Many within, times before. Yeah. It's just bizarre. Same, same story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so bizarre. So I think that there is definitely a, a connection that some people have that are more open to that kind of, whether that's, I don't Whatever know what you call that. But yeah. I don't know what you call it. I don't but, know what you call it. I don't know how to describe it exactly, but it's there. Yeah, there's definitely there. Something there. So let's talk about our business cards. And, and I say business Pretty cards. Cool. They're really cool. Um, if you will send us an email to... Newsworthy with <laughs> Stephen Jerry at gmail.com. <laughs> Sorry about that. It took me a minute to realize that was a prompt for me to actually say the email. <laughs> we'll be happy to send you some of these. Now, the cool thing about these cards are they're not standard business cards. They're actually square. Um, they have our logo on the front. The best part is they have a QR code on the back, which will allow access to every single one of our uh, episodes. So it's a link to our Libsyn site yeah which yeah has has links so to every episode if, if you'd like us to drop a few of those to you in the mail to spread out shoot us an email we'd love to send those out to you we'll get them out the well, same day or the next day or we should scan one of those put it up on the site too absolutely um uh, just just one of those fun things we're doing um guess what else i did yesterday jerry what should i say do? or should it just be a surprise no go ahead and, go ahead and say i ordered us some new shirts with our new logo on it Awesome. <laughs> I like the new logo. I love it. Um, Mochi's Mochi did that for us. Did Mochi's, a fantastic Mochi's, job with it. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So we're, we're stoked with that. So We need to get a link to her up on the page as well. But as soon as she creates her website, we'll do oh, that. Oh, I thought she had one. My not, not yet. <laughs> That's why it's not on That's why it's not yet. linked yet. Um, so in our interview with Jeff, we're going to talk about his book. Uh, you the can find that of a bourbon town. Yep, you can talk. You can find that at Amazon. the bottom of our web page. Uh, link directly to Amazon to pick that book up. We're also going to link to the old Anderson Hotel, um, so you can book a tour. Uh, because once you hear the interview, I think you're going to be excited. And you're going to see that. So if you're coming to Kentucky for haunted things, we have. Uh, Waverly Sanatorium in Louisville, big big deal. We have the bar that you covered, Mackey's, Bobby Ray Mackey's yep. uh, Bar and Grill, which is still open. You can still go there. You can still have a beer and still get haunted. And Anderson Hotel in between, and the Anderson right Hotel in between. in between. So good good opportunity to come get your haunts out. There's Absolutely. a lot of. If you're into the scare factor of actual haunted houses where people, you know, are in costume and they chase you and all that kind of stuff, there's a plethora of five-star rated haunted houses in this area. Be a great opportunity to take a couple days to a weekend, come see everybody, um, and, and just explore this area and how spooky it can be. And how absolutely gorgeous and beautiful this area of the country is if you're not from here, as you were alluding to earlier with the fall weather and the yep. change of colors. Awesome. It is, is awesome. Hello and welcome to Newsworthy. Two words, two question marks. Tonight we have an amazing guest. He is a man of many talents. He is a very recently retired Department of Corrections officer he is Central Kentucky's premier expert on all things ghostly and um, cryptid related. We have with us tonight Jeff Walridge. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're going to get right into it. You're a busy man at this time of year, so we're not going to take up a lot of your time. We're talking today about the Anderson Hotel. Tell us about it, Jeff. 
Well, it's it's a place that I've been uh, loosely associated with um, probably since 2015. There was a short amount of time where I was, you know, out. I didn't really work with it for a little bit, but uh, for the most part, I've been, you know, I, I basically discovered it, discovered it was haunted, it did all the investigations, and then, uh, you know, kind of found out what was going on there. I mean, when I first got into the place, I didn't even know if it was haunted or not. So, I mean, sometimes when you're messing with new places, you don't really know if you're going to be able to do anything with them. But luckily it was, and I figured it would be, being an old hotel. But you know how that stuff is sometimes. You just don't ever know. Sure. So how do you go about finding a new place like that? Well, it's they usually, I've been doing the ghost walk here for quite some time. And, uh, well, about 10 years. So, but I started researching it longer than that. So when I start researching a new place, you know, it, it all kind of comes into your lap kind of from the ghost tour type thing, you know, lately that's how wow. it's come out. And so I'll, I'll get new places and I'll go out and I'll have to investigate them. And I always tell people up front, I'm like, well, if it's not haunted, there's not much I can do about it, but <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you can't just make, me- make a building haunted. Right. And I don't think you'd want to. I think that'd be right. a bad power to have. <laughs> say, well, it's on it, guys. Here we are. We're Let's make some money. <laughs> so just to be clear, we're talking about the Ghost Walk and uh, Anderson Hotel right here in central Kentucky in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, um, the bourbon capital of the world. Take that, Bardstown. And um, Jeff has been doing, like he said, the Ghost Walk here in town for over 10 years. And now, when it comes to the Anderson Hotel, how did you first find out it was haunted? That's intriguing. Uh, just, I was invited up by the current owners, and uh, they had just acquired the place, and I'd been working with them on other things. And they said, you got to come see the hotel. I'd always kind of wanted in here. And then, uh, you know, that's kind of, we were off to the races after that. So, what was, uh, your fir- what was your first experience in there that you were like, oops, yep, this is haunted? <laughs> It's hard, honestly. Uh, probably footsteps and things at first. I mean, it was kind of like it was kind of quiet at first, and then it kind of picked up after that. So, you know, with any new location that I do like that, it's kind of you don't ever know what you're going to get into until you get there. And then once you're in it, you're like, oh, okay. Well, then you know there is something going on, or you know there's something we can we can work with here, but you don't really know until you're in there. And then when you're in there, you kind of go from there and figure out, you know, what's going on or at least closely figure out what's going on. And there you are. And in in the case of the the Anderson hotel, there's a lot going on. Right. It's a very complex situation. You know, I always tell people it's, it's decades and decades stacked on top of each other as far as hauntings go. So it's it's not an easy situation where it's like, okay, I know for sure it's this or that, or I know what that's going on. I mean, if somebody has a haunting in their house, then, you know, it's somewhat easier for them. You know what I'm saying? So, sure. but if, if we've got a situation where it's, um, you know, let's say the Anderson Hotel, for instance, you're looking at from 1935 to the 80s that, I mean, who knows? I mean... Who knows who died in some of these eras because a lot of that stuff's lost to history. Right. Now, in in the stuff that you do know about the hotel, what's happened in there that would, in your mind, say, yeah, that's probably that? Uh, We've had three suicides uh, that took place. One of those is still a mattress inside the building that, uh, you know, that, that a lady died on, so... Oh, Lord. still there, and that tends to cause issues. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what you get into. So, you know, when you have all of these personal items, uh, you know, like that, then they tend to hang around after that. Yeah, when I was doing some research about it, it looked like the Anderson Hotel had originally been the premier hotel, and then as the railroad came through... It, it seemed to turn more into a a a, a flop house, if you will. Yeah, that's that's um, what I always tell people. It was a flop house. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know what that is, but back in the day, I mean, that's that's what they called a place that kind of had a reputation of, you know, 
lots of stuff, you know. Right. Yeah, prostitution and gambling. Anything you can imagine kind of took place there. So, you know, prostitution, gambling, alcoholism, drug use. Uh, we've got a little bit of a little bit of record of all that kind of stuff. So, it's just part of its history, and it don't it does it no favors as far as like hauntings and stuff goes. So, it's weird actually. Interesting. Now, you guys have had some pretty famous ghost hunters in there aside from yourself of course uh yeah nick's nick groff has been here from uh ghost adventures and paranormal lockdown and stuff so he's he's filmed here uh grant wilson's been here from ghost hunters he didn't film he was just here so i mean we've had several people in here that's you know famous uh but you know they not maybe they didn't necessarily film it for tv or something like that right right well that's still impressive um, yeah, so they like to check the place out. Sure, sure. So there was a time that it had become pretty scary, and and that it was sealed. Is that right? That they, they said we... uh, that's, that's that's what the podcast and the the bloggers and things like that tend to want you to believe. That's not what happened, actually. Um, right. What actually happened was they well they started doing a haunted house. So in twenty seventeen, I left. And they started doing a haunted house, and uh, that's it. I mean, that's it. It was never really sealed. Oh, uh, gotcha. You know, that's just like good. They, like they make you want to believe it was right. That's just good for TV. <laughs> that, that's good. And and when I got back associated with the hotel in uh, last fall, that was one of my missions was to go out. And to, you know, fix this crap because yeah. there was so much this BS out there, honestly. And it was just made up and podcasts would kind of take their own creative freedom with it or, you know, online bloggers would kind of take their own freedom with it. And they were reporting things that just was not true at all. Yeah, that's no good. That doesn't do the... That doesn't do it justice. The, yeah, the it don't people. need any help. I mean, you know, it's got its own history. It, it right. It and really don't me, need that. When you start to sensationalize something, it takes away from the work that the real people are trying to do that are trying to make connections, that are trying to learn about the afterlife and what's going on there. Well, I worked and, very hard to, to make sure that you know, it was properly researched, and there was a lot of people that kind of, you know, took their own creative freedom with it. Yeah. And that's just, I mean, it's silly, because you don't need that. I mean, it's not necessary. You don't have to make anything up. When, when a building's got history like this, it's not, you don't have to make it up. Yeah. I can tell you some of the most scary places, I'm not a big fan of quote, unquote, the haunted houses where there's guys in masks that chase you and, you know, reach out and get the, you know, the pop scares. I'm much more creeped out and interested in this where it's real. You know, there's a presence. There's a a thing. There's something that's unexplained that's going on. There's a soul there that's trying to reach out for yeah. whatever reason. You know, I'm not a fan of haunted houses either, although I do one now. Uh, I really don't like them at all. Um, and I know that's strange sounding, but I mean, I hate the whole jump scare part of it. And I hate the whole aspect of, you know, this is going on, that's going on. And I don't like it. So, you know, we yep. still, and it's fun. And, you know, that's just kind of what we do. Yeah. I mean, you know, we in, in Kentucky, there's several, well-known haunts, if you will. The Anderson Hotel, uh, obviously the Waverly Sanator Sanatorium in Louisville, uh, Bobby Mackey's up on the river. Um, and, and those places don't require a dude in a mask to get you scared. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, I was always kind of a, you know, had a strange view on... Uh, Haunted attractions being in haunted places. Yeah. 
that's one reason I wanted to run it like uh, based on the history, I guess. No, that, but, that's that's perfect. You know, I think it pays more of a tribute to the story. But right. whatever. At the end of the day, it's it's all about scaring people and all that kind of thing. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you one of the most haunted places. I've been exposed to a few haunted places. And I, on several episodes, 100 episodes ago, I told the story, and I'll tell it again to you, because at some point when you come into the studio, I'm going to show you exactly where on the map this place is, because you got to check it out. Um, okay. It, it is, um, I used to do a job where I delivered uniforms and rugs and, you know, towels, one of those places like a Centos. Um and we had this church that we had to do. Now, we didn't go into the church proper. We went into the old parsonage, which had been converted to a youth center. And I, my job in that, and the only reason I bring it up is because that would that's the only reason there was two of us in a truck. But it was my job to learn the route of everybody. So when they took a vacation, I could fill in for them or whatever. Right. So me and the guy, Jason, we go to this parsonage and we get out. We got our rugs. We got our towels. And we go into the building. We have keys to these places or access, you know, key codes or whatever to get into them. And as soon as we walk in the door of this church, former parsonage, it was such a heavy, almost oppressive, like, presence, just like grinding on the, on the top of you, pushing you down. Right. And we kind of looked at each other and we're like, do you feel that or is it just and he you know he's looking at me the same way and so we're trying to do our job in there and it got to be so overwhelming we literally just threw the rugs and the, and the towels in the middle of the floor and we ran out of that building it was and if you just drive by it, if you just drive by it, it just looks like a ranch style little house but i have never been in such a presence of what I would consider pure evil as I was in that little house. Yeah, you never know what went on there. You know, a lot of churches and things, people do things, you know, uh, darker things and dark yeah. art and things. So, I mean, you really never really know what's going on in some of those places. Well, this is, you know, I, like I say, I'll show you, you've probably driven past it a hundred times and not even realized it. But the thing is, we even tried to reach out to the church. <laughs> of course, they didn't respond back. To us. This is, they probably thought we were some loon, loony bins or something. But, yeah, I, I've often thought about getting getting Jason on the podcast just to corroborate what I was saying because I have – it was oppressively evil. It wasn't like, oh, there's a shadow walking across the whatever or the – it was – I like I say, I, I've said it before, I say it again, there – I've never had such an oppressive, heavy, evil feeling. So I'm with you. This, the, the places that are real don't need the effects. No, they don't. It's not necessary, you know, and that's what people don't get sometimes is you don't have to make it up. If it's there, it's there. So you were talking about the bloggers and, and the, the podcasters taking, uh, you know, a lot of room, if you will, with the story. Now, if you research the Anderson Hotel online, there are pictures of people that have been bitten and scratched. And is yeah, that all legit? Three times, and oh, wow. uh, I missed one of those myself. So, I mean, I know what happens. It's just you know, it's it's strange, uh, and I've never been able to understand fully why. But. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's something that happens here, and but it hasn't happened for a little bit. So, really? it kind of, uh, you know, it's one of those situations where I'm still trying to figure it out. Do you think that it hasn't happened in a bit because you are trying to learn the history? You're trying to figure it out that you're trying to not play up to the negative side, but to embrace what it actually is. Then that's getting the story out for whatever issue there is there. Uh, maybe, um, I've thought about that some, I, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, it's one of those situations where I try to figure it out, but it ain't always easy to figure out. You know what I'm saying? So absolutely, yeah, especially uh, when you can't understand the entire history of it. Yeah, I mean, it's weird and I don't know. Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, that's the biggest answer I can give you on that one. That, that one's hard. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Figure it out sometimes. Yeah. I mean, you watch some videos, and you you never know what's real or fake out there. But some of the, some of the activity, I, I we we always at this time of year we do a ghost stories episode. And I got an episode from a lady who I personally know. I would have never expected this story from her um, about a time that she was with some gentlemen and they were doing a, a stakeout. I can't get into a great deal of detail because of the, the secrecy involved in her work, but all of them were accounted for. They heard something in the upstairs room, which was a like classroom type deal. And they were all like, what is that sound? So they all get up and they go up there and all of the desk had been stacked in one corner in like a, just a very few minutes. It, it would have taken 20 people to do it and just leave within the amount of time that it took them to figure out, Hey, there's something major going on. Let's go see what it is. And then they're like, okay, that's weird. That's creepy. Let's go back downstairs. And within two or three seconds, you know, two or three minutes, they heard it again and they go back and all the desks are perfectly arranged again. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. I, I can't, you know, some of the things that you know, say, were out you there. You think something's happened, but then you go to wherever it is and nothing's happened. So, Right. Now, on your ghost walks and, and things like that, I've never been on one of your ghost walks, and I live here. <laughs> it's so yeah. bizarre. Um, so do you, like, take the equipment? Do you Do you believe in that equipment that you see on TV? Is that a bunch of hokey stuff? Is that real? Is that... Um, but I think it has its place in, in investigations, but I don't, I don't solely use equipment. Gotcha. You know, I think that people get too wrapped up into that. And, you know, I'm an old school type investigator and I like to kind of go old school sometimes. And I think that sometimes works a lot better than other things. So you kind of got to see what works and what location it works in. Uh, I've seen times where somebody can take $800 worth of equipment into a place and nothing happens. Then I've seen other times where they take, you know, a recorder and they get everything they can imagine. So wow. it really is just, you'd never know. I mean, you really never know. So if, if you were to, from out of town, because we, you know, we obviously we go all over the, the country, and if, if people wanted to come see you at the Anderson Hotel or on a ghost walk, what's the best way of reaching out and scheduling that? Is uh, it already booked up full for the year? Can they get in nope, before yeah, Halloween? Getting ready actually to start doing some uh, some stuff with a bourbon tour company here in town, and uh, I'm getting ready to to start working on that and seeing if we can't do some out of season tours. So, I mean, you know, they can just kind of the Facebook page, like Lawrenceburg ghost walk is a good place to go. Old Anderson hotel is a good place to go. Um, I'll share it on my Facebook page, but I mean, it's not public, but you know, my public, uh, my public presence is pretty much with the hotel and things like that. So, gotcha. So it's not too late. They can actually still make a trip and make the plan and come see Kentucky for all its haunted wonder. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and and that's what I tell people. I'm like, you know, I, I'm, my plan is to, I've basically created the weird tourism in Anderson County. And I want to keep that going year round. And the reason I want to keep it going year round is because it helps the businesses and it helps people coming into town. So, you know, I want people to constantly be able to be here and be able to investigate and be able to experience, you know, the weird side of things. Yeah, that's amazing. I I think that it's just freaking awesome um, that you have invested so much time in and getting those things invested uh, or started. I mean, that that takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get these things going and to do the research. And so well, I would assume. You know, that's what I tell people all the time. I'm like, you know, it's it's not easy like people think it is. And, 
you know, sometimes that's what you get into. It's, it's, it's not as easy as people think it is to get anything going. So, I mean, I'm trying to start something new, you know, like the haunted house, for instance, me and the guys that built the place basically lived here for months. So, I mean, okay. it was very, very horrible. And I'm not saying <laughs> a bad thing, but I mean, I didn't want to live here for, you know, I've been in this building more than I'd ever like to admit. So, <laughs> Um, so, it's just part of it, I guess. So before we before we move on, what's the biggest, weirdest, craziest, unbelievableest thing that you personally have experienced at the Anderson Hotel? Um, just sometimes the voices and things. To me, it's the voices because the voices are harder to explain. Uh, I mean, I've seen things and all that kind of stuff, but. I mean, to me, the voices are, are one thing that I just, you know, you can't, you can't really explain when you hear somebody talking that ain't there or you hear, you know, there's nobody here and you're hearing the people saying things. I mean, that's, that's what's weird. Wow. So, that is that, weird. It's, it's the, it's the voices. Wow. I know Jerry and I are, are definitely planning to come down and, and do the tour. I can't wait for that. Um, so, but there's something I also want to cover. You've got something else that just came out that is something that everybody who's coming into this area needs to check out and something that most people anywhere in the world would like to get a good, good view of. What is that? You want to tell us about that? Yeah. Like, um, so it's called a haunting of a bourbon town and, um, it's a book and it's written about Lawrenceburg and Anderson County. And it don't just cover the hotel or anything. There's quite a bit in there about the hotel, but you know, it covers other places in town that I normally don't get to go on on ghost tours and things like that. So, you know, it is a chance for me to tell other stories and that's kind of the reason why I did it. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it took a little time to get out there. And John Cosper is a really great writer. He's wrote a lot of books for wrestlers and things. This is his first like ghost book that he's, co-wrote with me so uh you know it's on amazon if people want to check it out um awesome. or if you see me or you come to the haunted house you can get a signed copy you can get signed copies from john's web page uh it's uh dead park books i believe is is the web page but uh yeah i mean i i would love for people to check it out it's it's not a long read it's a couple hundred pages but the cool part about it is you know, it, it, it covers a lot of history and things, too. It's not just ghosts. So uh, people have really enjoyed both aspects of it. So that's on Amazon. Check that out, A Haunting of a Bourbon Town. Yeah, The Haunting um, of a Bourbon Town is the name of it. And it's, uh, it's real. I mean, people have enjoyed it. But the the way that I wrote it and the way that I want it written, what done was I wanted it to be like me telling a story. That's and, awesome. So that's the reason why that it, it it literally sounds like me sitting down and telling people a story. That's that's perfect. I the, actually, I mean, that's that's you know when you're trying to learn something, I don't know. Everybody learns a little different, but if I feel like you're talking specifically to me, I'm going to pick that up a lot a lot right. faster than if I'm trying to read a textbook. So um, yeah, I think that uh, I think it works uh, for that reason, and I mean. I wouldn't, I wouldn't write a book that I can't read. You know, if I, if it's hard to read, then I'm not gonna, I'm like, eh, I hate dry books. Right. So it's one reason why that I, I was very specific about the way that I wanted it and the style that I wanted it done in. Well, that's fantastic. We'll put a link to it on our podcast, uh, directly to the Amazon site. Um, and you guys, you said you had another website that the old Anderson hotel. Yeah. Uh, old Anderson, no V, just oldandersonhotel.com. If they need to reach me, they can go through there, or you can go to Lawrenceburg Ghost Walk. Um, you can, they can get me through there as well. So, um, you know, that's that's the two easiest way to get a hold of me. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you being with us tonight, Jeff. We would cordially invite you back after you get settled from Halloween because sure. we are going to be starting a multi-part. Uh, storyline involving one of your favorite cryptids, Bigfoot, Sasquatch slash Yeti, 
Um, I have a very personal connection to that as well, which will probably blow your mind. <laughs> so, yeah. so let's do that because I, I want to make sure that we, we cover it, you know, extensively. So, you know, I'm happy to come on anytime. Absolutely. Jeff Walbridge, thank you very much for being here. Again, the book is called A Haunting of a Bourbon Town, and we'll put a link to it at the end of the at the end of the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Man, that episode is really interesting. And if you'll stick around for us for just a few commercials, we have another great story to tell you. Hi, this is Ed Locke with USA Mortgage. When it comes to buying a home, the process can be overwhelming and confusing. With so many options, it can be hard to know where to start. That's why it's important to work with a certified mortgage loan originator. I have the knowledge and expertise to guide you through the process and find the best mortgage option for you. I will work with you every step of the way to ensure that you are getting the best deal possible. So if you're looking to purchase or refinance, please reach out to me at 502-680-0953. So don't take on the stress of buying a home alone. Work with me and I will make your dream a reality. Trust the professionals and make your home buying experience a positive one. MLS ID 448908, DAS Acquisition Company, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, MLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is equal housing opportunity. If you want us to review or rate your product on air, if you have suggestions for new episodes, awesome ghost stories, or anything else, please reach out to us. Our email address is newsworthywithstephenjerry at gmail.com. Our text number is area code 540-709-1318. And now, back to the story. On January 14th of 2002, 20 miles north of Paintsville, Kentucky, a train carrying coal had a close encounter with a large hovering object that was flying along the tracks in front of it. Seeing the lights, however, coming from around the bend, the crew just assumed it was another train approaching on another track and thought nothing of it. But as the train rounded the bend, the computer and all the onboard instruments began going berserk, and the engines spontaneously shut themselves off. In fact, one crewman's watch stopped working at exactly 2.47 a.m. The crew saw three UFOs with searchlight beams scanning the nearby river as if they were looking for something. The train, still rolling on inertia at about 30 miles per hour, struck the first object, clipping the tops of the first three cars and leaving several severe gouges in the train's steel hull. All the objects immediately took off. After getting emergency power systems going, the crew notified their dispatcher and appraised them of the situation. They were advised to go on down to the Paintsville, the, re, the abandoned Paintsville train yard, and assess the damage there. Two hours later, the badly dam- damaged train hobbled into Paintsville. What happened next sounds like it came right out of a out of a movie. The crew, but it's the crew's story, and they're sticking to it. They were greeted by a huge entourage of government officials who immediately took charge of the train and everyone aboard. Teams were already in place to disconnect the damaged cars from the rest of the train and roll them into a large tent that had been hastily erected to conceal them. The crew, allegedly held for hours and interrogated, were given medical tests, and they were told to keep quiet about the entire incident due to national security. They were taken to a little place called Martin, where they were questioned all over again by railroad officials, given drug tests, and eventually released. They were sent back to work just eight hours later after a short nap, and they noticed as they passed through the Paintsville area again that the tent, the cars, and everything associated with the incident were packed up and gone. The only remaining thing that even could indicate something had happened was that there was noticeable coal spillage back where the collision originally happened. If this story is true, it would indicate that these UFOs were either an experimental aircraft of our creation, or they were truly a UFO. 
multi the 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 UFOs were described as being silver, about twenty feet long and ten feet high, with various multicolored lights. It sounds something like the current trends of our own cutting edge aircraft, which would tend toward the triangular shape. But who can say for sure? And Jerry, if you can't see the light, be the light.